Welcome to the Old Man of the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 146, Jose Alvarado and C.J. McCollum live show. Tommy, always good to spend a few days in New Orleans. Always. Never disappoints. Eating good. <laughs> Eating good. Um, we mentioned this on the live show. Our first stop, naturally, as soon as we got off the airplane and dropped our bags at the hotel was Turkey and the Wolf. Our boy Mason came through with pretty much the entire menu. Literally first stop, like none of us were checked into our rooms. You 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 landed, you put your bags out the hotel, and then we went to Turkey and the Wolf. <laughs> Shout out to Jason and Kylie who got their first Turkey and the Wolf experience. The wedge salad in particular was a standout item for Kylie. Uh, one note on the live show, this is our fourth one. As always, we donate all the proceeds from the night, merch sales, uh, ticket sales, everything to a local charity. Jose uh, got to choose the charity this time, and all the proceeds will be going to the New Orleans Recreation Department Commission, uh, which is an organization that provides recreational outlets to the youth of New Orleans. Always a good cause. Tommy, we got into a lot with Jose and CJ. This was a really fun uh, conversation. We bring out Jose first, and we talked about the Chris Paul beef. We talked about creating value and embracing a role. Um, and then CJ pops on. Uh, we talk with him as the president of the NBPA about the load management issue, which I think will be an issue going forward yep. um, in the CBA. And I think it will be uh, apparently the NBA is discussing now tying games played to end of season awards, which is interesting and, and makes sense to me. But I think the other thing we talked about with these guys, we taped this on uh, Thursday night right after the trade deadline. And we talked about the Western conference and how much better the Western conference got since we scheduled this in between we scheduled it when we taped it and CJ, I think in particular, uh, you know, had some really interesting things to say about just this, this shifting landscape of the whole league. Yeah. And we touch on the Western conference a bit in this week's old man, the three things that episode came out Monday. You can find some of our thoughts on our YouTube channel, uh, or you can go subscribe on Amazon music. Uh, and lastly in the show, um, partially because Jose was on the show, uh, we draft the best sports agitators, a draft that I definitely ran away with. You're very confident. We'll see. Tommy, before we get to our conversation with Jose and CJ, I think it's important that we talk about the hottest team in basketball right now, and that is the Milwaukee Bucks. They won last night against Boston. Uh, we'll get to some uh, anecdotes about that game in a second. But they won last night against Boston. They've won 11 games in a row. They're tied with now with Boston in the last column. Uh, essentially the best record in the NBA. They started out the season super hot. Uh, had a lull there. But they look like a true championship contender right now. Yep. We talked, we've talked about this last year and this year about when all three of Giannis, um, Middleton, and Drew play how good they are. They're now 14 and two this season with all three of them playing. Um, but can you talk about Giannis for a second? Because, you know, this is Giannis we're talking about. And this, I'm curious where this ranks for you in terms of his best stretches of his career. Uh, pretty much the top. I mean, here's the deal. Because um, I, I, we're, we are going to have a little discussion about his MVP odds. Um, he was, he's been great all season. I will say that he's been great all season. For Giannis, there was a stretch there where he wasn't as efficient as he's been. And he had to do a lot um, with Chris Middleton out of the lineup. The team in particular, although a number of players have, uh, have improved their three-point shooting, the team in particular was really struggling early in the season on shooting threes. And even during this win streak, they're only 13th in offense over the 11 games in, in, relative to the rest of the NBA. It has been their defense. They're second during this win streak in the NBA in defensive rating. They're second for the season, just 22nd offensively. So Giannis is having to carry an unusually high workload uh, on that end of the floor. During the win streak, 37 a game, 13 rebounds, 6 assists, 58% from the field. Actually, if you go back all the way to this December 19th game, so a longer stretch here, 34 and a half, 13 and a half rebounds, a little under six assists, 55% from the field. The turnovers are an issue. Uh, again, if, if you're going to be a high turnover team or a high usage player that turns the ball over a lot, which a lot of them do, 
and you're not going to shoot threes well, but you're going to take a lot of threes. That's to me where this offense suffers a little bit. Just a math equation. Yeah. Uh, I saw the stat after their before last night when they had won 10 in a row. Uh, Giannis is the first player since Oscar Robertson in 1964 to go 35, 10, and 5 on a 10 game winning streak. It feels like a little bit like we talked about with LeBron a couple weeks ago. He is just kind of taking all of these, um, he's taking all of these sort of milestones and smashing through them. The other thing, he's now two assists away from being the Bucks all time leader in assists. Yes. <laughs> so he will be the Bucks all time leader in assists by the time that this airs. It's crazy because the reason I'm dressed like this, I apologize for wearing this suit, Tommy. The reason I'm dressed like this is because I just got uh, home from first take and we, we had a discussion about Kevin Durant's legacy and anecdotally in that conversation, I, I kind of went through who I think are the top 10 players, top 10 to 15 all time. And I mentioned names past 15. Um, I didn't mention Giannis because he, he's still, it still feels like he's early in his career. To me, <laughs> this is a guy, I don't think it's a stretch to say he's going to go down as a top 15 player ever. I, I don't think it's a stretch to say he has a really good chance to be in the conversation as a top 10 player of all time. And I recognize that every modern NBA player has all the haters in the world, all the haters in the world. So Giannis travels too much. Uh, Giannis plays bully ball. Giannis can't make free throws. Giannis can't shoot jumpers. Great. The motherfucker dominates. <laughs> like, what? What more do you want me to say? Great. I get it. I hate to tell you guys, there is no perfect basketball player. There is no basketball player without zero flaws in their game. None. George is the greatest player of all time. LeBron, who, LeBron's the greatest player. Whoever. I don't care. I love these. I They've love all got flaws in their game. There's, all, there's always something you can nitpick. You can't nitpick with greatness. I love these stupid nitpicks because it just sets up these rants. It just allows you to just get going. I want, so Giannis aside, um, who else in this run has been impressive? Drew obviously went for 40 last uh, night and he's been great. But what else about this team, um, you know, is putting them in, in, in this position? And the second question I actually was just thinking about this on the way over here today. Do you think it matters whether they have the one seed or not? Oh, good question. Um, obviously, game seven last year in Boston. Uh, yeah, it, I think it matters. I think when you're talking about two teams that had that series last year, obviously Middleton not in there, but had that series last year, they seem like they're set up on a collision course to meet in the conference finals. Yeah, I'll say home court matters. I'll say it matters. I want to put my hater hat on for one second. Just put it on. Um, I'm not shitting on the winning streak. I'm not. Because it is so hard to win an NBA game. It really is. I don't care who's in the lineup. I don't care if you're at full strength and another team is missing a key player. It's still hard to win. You're playing against NBA players. You're playing against a game plan scheme by some of the greatest coaches in the world. It is hard to win. I do want to just note, okay, about this win streak. In this win streak, they've beaten the Nuggets. Jokic didn't play. They've beaten Indiana. Halliburton wasn't back yet. They beat New, beat New Orleans. Ingram wasn't back yet, and obviously Zion was missing. They beat the Lakers. LeBron did not play. That was the game after he broke the all-time scoring record. They beat the Clips with both Paul George and Kawhi. They did do that. They beat the Heat with Jimmy and Bam in the lineup and Tyler Hero. The second time they beat the Clips, Kawhi did not play. And last night against Boston, no Smart, no Tatum, no Jalen Brown, no Al, Horf Al Horford. Again, not shitting on the win streak, but I kind of am. I'm not saying it's not a valid well, win streak. Your, there's your load management. I'm just saying there's a there's some context here. There's some context. But we we actually I've brought this up. I think specifically about the Warriors at times. When you get a team that's really good, and they feel whole, and Middleton has played a, a bunch of these games in this win streak, and they feel whole, and you have a, a star player playing the way Giannis is playing. You may just get lucky and go on what not I'm not saying the win streak's lucky. You may get lucky and you may play some teams in a him. stretch where they're missing players, either due to load management, either due to injury, whatever it may be. And Milwaukee's on that right now. That's not to say, Tommy, I don't think Milwaukee is one of the best teams in basketball and one of the best contenders. Uh the I saw the NBA released the, their latest defensive player of the year ladder, and Brooke has passed um Jaron Jackson, so he's now number one. 
We've talked about him a ton on the show. You are a huge fan of Brooke Lopez, but is there anything in particular this year that you think that I think he's shooting the highest three point percentage of his career? Um, but is there anything in particular that you think he's doing differently um, that has you know kind of allowed him to reach this level? No, I, I don't think I don't think there's anything differently. I think it's a a sort of natural maturation that happens with smart players who have a good skill set. It's like an accumulation of corporate knowledge to me. And the emphasis this year for the Milwaukee Bucks has been in limiting three-pointers. And so Brooke has been in drop coverage for years in this system, but they've also helped in, which hasn't really made a lot of sense because he always is in such a heavy drop. This year, they're staying home more, especially in the corners, and they're allowing these two-on-two pick-and-rolls to materialize where they're not overhelping. And that's put a lot on him, and he's been great. And so I think it's it's all this experience that he's had. And and is he great at switching? He's good. Yeah, he's. I don't. I don't know what the numbers are. If I'm talking about centers who switch, I'd probably go with Jaron Jackson Jr. or Nick Claxton or uh, of course uh, Bam. I'd probably go with those guys. I, I but Brooke can do it. So he 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 can sort of do it all, whether it's drop or, or switching at times against certain players. So to me, it's just, it's just like the, the, um, it's like, a, it's like a great, it's like a great player just realizing and maximizing his ability. Uh, on the, on the front about the Bucks being contenders, their odds on DraftKings Sportsbooks pretty much have not changed. They fluctuated between plus 600 and plus 800 all season. Uh, they're currently at plus 600, which is, has, is the third best odds. Boston Celtics, have the highest odds, Phoenix Suns leapfrogging after the Kevin Durant trade. The number two, they're at plus 450 right now. Um, here's what's interesting, though. When we talk about the Eastern Conference, I found this I found this really interesting. So Boston has the best odds, Milwaukee second, Philly third. In terms of the percentage of handled, the percentage of actual money going towards a team, Milwaukee has 38% of the money bet on them to win the East. Boston has just 14%. So there are some there are some sharks out there who are betting heavily, and, and again, some of this may, may just be the odds, and they they bet earlier in the year when the odds were at plus four hundred to win the East versus where they are now at, at plus two forty. You, you think some of that is is a a level of like this is a team that went seven games last year, like we said, without Middleton, one hundred percent, and and like it's and it's Giannis. Chris, you put Chris Middleton on that team. I mean, who knows? It's it's one game; anything can happen. But will Giannis win? his third MVP? That's a question. Will Jokic win his third MVP? Will Embiid win his first? It's interesting. Tatum hasn't played as well as he was playing early in the season of late, and his MVP odds have dipped considerably. He was the front runner for uh, a a couple months of the season. Jokic now uh, the odds-on favorite because he's at negative 155. Joel second with plus 350. Giannis plus 750. On DraftKings Sportsbook, I like that Giannis bet a lot. I like it a lot. <laughs> I think it's going to be if if the Bucks finish first in the East and Denver finishes first or second in the West. I think it's going to be really interesting to see that decision. Yeah, I I look at the season for these awards, and again, I don't have a vote, but I look at the season as a whole. I look at it as a whole, and if you were to tell me right now, Bucks finish first in the East and Giannis. I mean, maybe not 37 a game for the rest of the year, but is doing what he's done since December 19th, 34 and a half, 13 and a half rebounds, 5.6 assists. It's a really tough decision because Jokic is that awesome. Giannis has been that awesome. Joel, of course, is awesome. Um, yeah. And then you start talking about, you know, all NBA stuff with, <laughs> with these guys. It yeah. just, it's, it's fascinating. NBA fans, it's time to bring the hoops action to the palm of your hand with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. This week, new customers can download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and sign up with code JJ. Right now, you can bet $5 on any pregame Moneyline bet and get $150 in bonus bets if your team wins. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. As always, just a reminder, our weekly show, The Old Man and the Three Things, is available on the Wondery app and Amazon Music. Please go subscribe to our YouTube channel 
And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our newsletter, A Farewell to Takes. Very easy to find. You can find a link to subscribe on our social channels or at 342.com. All right, let's get to our conversation with Jose Alvarado and CJ McCollum. Hello, 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 New Orleans. What's up, guys? Nothing but love for this city. Tommy, of course, uh, my favorite place in the United States of America. We had to make one stop today before, as soon as we got off the plane, pretty much, and that was our old spot, Turkey and the Wolf. Ate entirely too much. A um, few notes before we bring Jose on stage. First of all, tonight's proceeds are going to NORD, New Orleans Recreation Development uh, Basketball Division. Uh, any merch we sell, all the tickets, proceeds, all go into that. If you want more information on that, it's nordc.org. Uh, great organization helping uh, kids in New Orleans uh, provide a safe and welcoming environment for recreational, athletic, and cultural experiences. I mentioned the merch. Uh, we have a merch stand, go get some, post them on social. Uh, and we had the DraftKings uh, promo code, you guys get $100 in free bets if you download the app, that'll be up at the end of the show. Um, Tommy, what do you got? JJ, what's your favorite non-basketball New Orleans memory? Non-basketball New Orleans memory. And it can't be revolving Twitter either. We'll get to that. Um, oh, yeah. I would say, my so my first year here, was pre-COVID, and that was a special, special experience. I'm actually gonna tell two quick stories. The first one, um, my kids were in preschool, we, we got them into Newman, and Newman was kind enough to let us come down, basically when I started training camp, which was the end of September, and the very first weekend we got down here, right before media day, um, Knox's class, my oldest, they had a, a get-together um, at City Park, and I went, I was talking to some parents, and I was talking to this one guy, and he said to me, uh, I asked him where he's from, he said, I'm from Canada. I said, oh, interesting. He said, yeah, I've been down here about eight years. Um, he said, there's something about New Orleans, it just gets in your blood and it sticks. And I said to him, I think that's the humidity. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fucking hot here. Um, but he was right, because there is something about this place, this region, this area, the people, the culture, uh, the sports fans, it just gets in your blood and you fall in love and that happened to me. And then the other favorite story was I went to um, some random brass band uh, on a Monday night with Wynn Butler and that was like the most New Orleans experience. I mean, there were people dancing in tunics. Uh, I'm not really sure what was happening that night, but that was it. Tommy, you referenced Pell's 12. Yep. You reference Pell's 12. I want to clarify one thing. How, do we have anybody tonight from Pell's 12 here? Woo! Let's go. Let's go. All right, we got a few of you. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you for no longer hating us. I appreciate it. I want to explain this real quick. Uh, Jason, who does all our video editing and all our content producing, he doesn't even know what this is. So some of you know this. I, um, I We did a podcast right after I got traded from the Pelicans. I spoke somewhat unkindly about a single individual. And from that point, for a number of months, there were a, a few individuals on Twitter that kept sort of trolling me and saying things about me. And one night I just had enough. And couple, I- Couple I, glasses I, of wine maybe? Yeah, it, it was, yeah, it was during the playoffs and was watching some games and there was this meme and it, it was half the meme was a picture of me in my podcast gear and it said, you have a podcast. And if I remember correctly, because the, the, the post has been deleted, the other half of the meme was uh, Brandon Ingram and Dom Toretto from Fast and the Furious. And it said, we have a family. <laughs> and I wrote back to that. I said, yeah, all 12 of you. I was talking about the people on Twitter, the same like John, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, that was coming after me. I was not talking about New Orleans Pelicans fans. I recognize there's more than 12 of you. So we, we appreciate that. Um, we're gonna have a great show. We got Jose Alvarado, we got CJ McCollum. We're gonna have our draft. Uh, I know there's a couple of the Pelicans players here, a couple of uh, 
Pelicans coaches here as well. Thank you for supporting the show. We appreciate y'all. Let's bring Jose Alvarado out on stage. Let's go. <laughs> How y'all doing? Yeah. It's always good to be home, you know? First live podcast for you, right? Yeah, first one. Kind of nervous, actually, but it's all good. You were great backstage. I know, I know, but you know, now you I You were great the, backstage. You know, the lights are pretty bright, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, we, just, we just saw this. There, there's something special, the, the chanting, the Jose. Um, I just found out tonight you, you have your own mix now that the, they <laughs> yeah. play on the speakers. But that sort of... Uh, relationship, that symbiotic nature of player fan and being embraced by that, how much does that mean to you? And also just why do you think they've done that for you specifically? New Orleans, man, they show me so much love and it actually makes me want to just go hard every time, you know, regardless in, in life, you know, it just the love and, and the, the embrace that they gave me was just so, so much to take in. And, you know, when um, I started playing, I just felt it like, wow, this is this is where I was supposed to be. This is where this is home for me. So um, without them, I probably would have never been, you know, GTA, Jose, you know, all that. So shout out to you know the city. Love that. We we talked about this with you a little bit before. I think the last time you were on. But when do you feel like last year you started to really understand that this was sort of happening? Man, I used to uh, question all, you know, my PD person, be great. You know, I was like, I, I, and, I, and this is all honestly, I used to ask, you think I'm gonna play? Like, you think I'm gonna be here for a while? And he kept on just saying, just stay, stay the course, stay the course. And you know, um, COVID situations hit, you know, I got certain opportunities. And um, the first time I, I felt like this was real, it was the play-in game, you know, when we were playing the Clippers and the Spurs. And, you know, I started taking a little leap and with, you know, with the big stage and it was just like, all right, I, I'm here. I could be here, this is me. I, I want to tell you uh, that Tommy and I are very grateful for your time tonight. We're very grateful for CJ's time. We're also grateful that neither of you got traded today. Because <laughs> yeah. that would have sucked. That would have sucked. And we are also grateful because we've been monitoring this over the last couple of weeks. We're grateful that you guys are not on a 13-game losing streak. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank God for <laughs> you, that one, yeah. You've won the, <laughs> the last three. But on the podcast, for anybody that listens on a regular basis, we've, we've touched on the Pelicans this season and how deep you guys are. Obviously, health is an issue. I was looking back. You, you were 23-12, and 23-13, and 13, the game that Zion got hurt uh, and then hit a rough patch. Um, and it's amazing how fast things can sort of change in the NBA. But given the addition of Josh Richardson, everything else in the West, where's your sort of confidence level when this team is whole? I think we're still confident. You know, we're missing a big part, you know, number one. But when he get back healthy, you see how good we, was, we were, you know, number one, top three in the West. But uh, we're still confident. You know, this is, a, this is how the league is. I'm learning. It's a roller coaster. You, you, you lose 10 in a row, you can win 20 in a row. So it's just stuff like that happens. But um, we're, we're very positive in this locker room. You know, obviously with this trade with Josh and, you know, Tay, we're going to miss him. But um, we're just trying to improve and, you know, make sure we keep winning games because the West got tough, obviously, right? <laughs> Specifically with Zion, um, I, you know, I, obviously I played with him um, and he did some incredible things. Is there, is there a moment? Is there a play? Is there something that he does on a regular basis maybe that particularly stands out about his game and his athleticism? Ooh, that's hard, you know. You know which way he's going. He's going left, right? So, <laughs> I, no one can stop us. So that's just, you know, I think just God tapped him in his shoulder and said, you're going to be special. It's really nothing, you know, out there that is his weak. It's no weakness. Yeah, he, you know, Zion said, why do, he tells you, you think I'm going to shoot? No, you can't stop me going left. So, <laughs> like, he literally, he, he, he's an amazing player, you know. He's definitely one, one of, <laughs> one of, like, one of a talent. And, you know, I really haven't had a moment. I mean, in college, you know, I had, he was at George, he was at Duke, I was at Georgia Tech. I remember him guarding me, and um, I went back door. I think he let me now. Now I watched the video. <laughs> he let me go back door, 
And I thought I had a free layup. And next thing you know, he, he jumps and blocks it with two hands. I think his face is at the rim. And I thought I had a free layup. And then after that, I wasn't a big fan. I'm like, ah, Z might not make it to the league, you know, whatever. Ah. <laughs> and then little do you know, I'm his teammate. You know, he is one of the best. I'm a big fan of him, and man, I can't wait to get him back. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I, there, we're going to talk more about this with CJ. But there are varying levels of players in the NBA. And there's varying skill sets, and there's varying uh, sizes and uh, athletic makeups. I, you know, of course, was never the most <laughs> athletic guy. Um, but I believe firmly that every team needs a Jose Alvarado. Let's roll that video. <laughs> You're just going to have to leave. Watch out. Alvarado, see you later. <laughs> and the Pelicans take and a steal by yeah. Alvarado. Look out. Here's Jose. There's Jose. Just couldn't get this to go. With the energy in here, when Alvarado... <laughs> see how he's hiding? He's hiding over in the corner. Go back and show that again. He looked like he was out of bounds, like he was not even in the game. But the thing is, Jose was trying to dribble the ball out. He was trying to dribble the ball out. That's the one. Yeah, that's the one right there. <laughs> yeah, man. Do you, have a, do you have a favorite of these? Huh? Do you have a favorite? Uh, yeah, I mean, the playoff one with Chris Paul definitely was one of my favorite ones. You know, but, man, that's, that's just, that's just crazy. Looking at that, it makes, brings it, uh, joy to me. It makes, you know, it makes me want to keep going. Every, every player wants to score. Um, every player wants to be a star. Um, I've mentioned this on the podcast, but I, I'm coaching my eight-year-old. He's in second grade. He's playing on a third grade team. And I talked to the kids the other day, and I was like, how, you know, I was trying to motivate them. And I'm like, how many of you want to play in high school? And they all raised their hand and immediately said, no, we want to play in the NBA. But in, but in the NBA, in college and high school, um, everybody has a role. I think most players that get to the NBA have been a star in high school, have starred in college. And it's, I think, difficult to transition into a different role, especially early in your career. Where did you sort of find that piece of embracing the role of Jose Alvarado? I mean, um, I think I knew it when I got to college. I said, yo, there's so many people good at this game. You know, like people could jump out this world, people could shoot out this world. So what's gonna make me different? And then everyone kept on saying, you always like winning. I think everyone liked winning, but it was like, you do anything to win. Like you really out there, you know, scrapping, doing everything. So I figured out, you know, be a starring role, you know, and even in college, you know, I'm a, I wasn't, a, you know, the best scorer in college at all. You know, my best player probably was a kid named Mike DeVoe. And even if I was a senior, I had to step back because I knew we need him to win games. So I just try to play, embrace the role of just winning games. And, you know, in the NBA, there's so many people in this league, so many people didn't try to make it to the league. It's so, so, so good. And uh, I always, I told somebody this, you know, when you get drafted or when you go to the league and you high school, you're number one player in high school, number one player in college, you don't get worse in the NBA. It's about the role they give you and if you like it or not. And then, obviously, uh, your mental and all that comes a part of it. But I think uh, a big part of it is just, um, you know, accepting your role and being a star at that role. And I'm okay with that star. You know, people score in this league, people rebounds, people going to defend, people going to bring energy. And then my skill was I'm going to defend and bring as much energy as I can. And, um, and I just, you know, that's the role I want to play. In, in year two, though, I, I assume there was a novelty uh, it, going through the NBA for the first time, playing the amount of games. In year two, how have you found it uh, in terms of maintaining that edge and that chip and that that uh, motivation to to bring that every night, you know, be great. You know, my PD person again, he told me, you know, it was always a second year slump. You don't want to be that, 
I'm like, heck, no, nah, I ain't going to be no slump. So um, me coming in, you know, obviously I had a great playoff run. You know, my name got out there. Everybody loved it. And I was excited. You know, everyone came out telling me. Everyone was felt like more nervous than me. They kept telling me, now they know you, so now what you going to do? I said, I don't want them to know me. That's the point. Like, I want them to go out there and I'm going I'm to work. The summer, that, the second summer I had, I can't, I did the same work, worked a little, worked harder, worked, did the same thing, nothing special. I wasn't going out there and on my workout, doing 100 dribbles and trying to windmill and nothing will get bounced, you know. I was just doing the same thing I was doing and then try to do it at a high level. And, you know, um, you know, it's a little funny story with CJ. I don't know if you want me to say now or wait till you get out here. You can bring it up in a second. You can bring it up in a second. Uh, I, so, yes. I wanted to just anecdotally, and I'll let Tommy jump in here, so the the talk I gave my team the other day, it was a very traumatic experience for me. I had uh, I had Leo tell me he's going to be better than me in the NBA. <laughs> and, make more um, and then I, I had I, I had my guy Desi, um, speaking of, you know, you don't get worse in the NBA. He said to me, uh, yeah, you were way better in college than you were in the NBA. <laughs> Which is a different role. <laughs> and you didn't get worse. I'll tell you that like, much. <laughs> no, no, I was better. I was better in the end. Um, do you have a do you have a nemesis crowd yet? Do you have a fan base that that you know hates you and maybe you hate as well? Yeah, it's a Phoenix. Phoenix. <laughs> I never um, really experienced, you know, the hate and like, you know, bull crowd thing until I went to Phoenix. <laughs> I was like, I came in, subbed in, I'm like, I'm a role player, and they're not gonna care. I soon I touched the boy with boo, I said. <laughs> but I thought it was gonna stop, and it didn't stop. It kept going. So I was like, whatever. <laughs> I would love a rematch in the playoffs of last year's Phoenix Me too. New Orleans series. <laughs> and I'm glad you brought this up. Can you roll that tape? Get it done. And on the spin and the reverse, the slam by Zion. I know you didn't like it. Six game winning streak for the Pals. I don't think they're there. Yeah, Jose and Chris Paul at the end of the game. And, and he got into Chris Paul. No, but th this came from the last two possessions, though. Right. But it I, came from they, the last two possessions with Larry Nance shooting the layup when the game is over. I see you, Najee. I know he's out there. Seriously, though, what's up with you and Chris? <laughs> this is like the ninth time oh, in man. two years. I mean, like I said, I give him his credit as a basketball player. You know, um, he's a really good, probably one of the top five point guards, right? But me and him, when, we, when you're on the same court, not the biggest fan at all. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like I said, uh, you know, um, I think we bump heads because we compete. We both compete at a high level, you know, and I... He knew I was obviously a, a fan of him going into the NBA. And I don't know if he was just what they expected or whatever, like to kiss ass. And that's not what I was going to do with him. You know, I wanted to compete. And he just took it to a whole other level. So um, I just left it at that. And hey, I'm here with, I'm going to be the same way every single time now. So <laughs> yeah. Um, you kind of brought up the shooting. And I think that's been a, a big improvement in your game, you're up to 34%, um, shooting more volume. Um, was that a point of emphasis this summer, going into this season, getting better? What drove that sort of uh, point of emphasis? Yeah, it was big on me, you know. Uh, you know, we have an exit meeting. You know about the exit meeting. You know, they told me to improve what you need to improve and what you did it good and stuff like that. And um, I knew that's one thing I wanted to improve for myself and obviously I needed it for my game. And I came, and I always looked at the team. You know, we're going to get Z back. They're going to leave somebody open. They're not leaving nobody else. They're going to leave me open. So let's make them pay. And, you know, I just wanted to do it for myself because I knew I was capable of it. So when I just locked in in the gym, and um, obviously with a great shoe like you, you know you're going to have nights on and off, but you got to be confident. You know, I think confidence is a big thing about being a shooter. I mean, if I had your jump shot, I'd be really, really good. But, <laughs> um you know, I just went in there and just, you know, been confident and worked out. You know, work, just, you know, continue shooting, just continue shooting. And, you know, I knew it was going to pay off eventually. With the, with the Denver game in particular, is there something gratifying about, like, like we've talked about a bunch with you about knowing your role, but you also can score. I mean, you scored in college. You have, you, you've shown these flashes in the league of, like, 
people shouldn't forget that you know how to light it up when you want to. Was there a part of you after you did that where you're like, just like, look, motherfuckers, like I can <laughs> do this too? Um, I just wanted to be really good in my role, but that night it was just like, this is a different role for you today. So, um, you know, uh, with that night was special. You know, you know, JJ knows when you make your first two shots, uh, it might be one of those nights. I made my first two shots. My third one, I was like, oh, it might be a long night for Denver. So um, <laughs> it was just that. And, you know, and also with a system I got with my teammates, you know, shout out to them. If you look at the game, they kept looking for me, screening for me. And, you know, it just felt comfortable. And then, like I said, I, I worked really hard and I knew I, I could, I'm capable of it. One of the big topics around the NBA this season is, is scoring being up. And January, we saw, I think, a record number of guys go for 40 points. We've seen 50-point games, 60-point games, Donovan Mitchell, 71-point games. Jeez. And uh, for, for a lot of them, I'll be honest with you, I was, I, you know, I, whether I was watching in, uh, on TV or at the game in person or, or um, checking the box scores the next morning, I was like, fuck, man, that's crazy. That guy's going nuts. But there was one game in particular where I was like, wait, what? When I saw the box score... <laughs> And it was, uh, it was Denver at New Orleans. And I said, Jose Alvarado had 38? <laughs> he wasn't roll, the only let's one. Let's roll the tape. Let's roll the tape. <laughs> Jose. Keep it. Yeah, he wanted to go back to Larry. And he got the mismatch now. Deep three. Okay. Feeling good. Feeling real good. Shot clock coming down. This is the shot right here. Made me feel like it was this, is the, this is the one I knew you were. Yeah. Again, that was a heater. Jose, a three. Oh! How are you feeling, buddy? <laughs> Billy has the small brown on him. Jose, deep track. Again, if you make it, it's difficult to make. Incredible! CJ with Zion, who's been the point. The hot hands, that little guy. Loader. And wide out of teardrop. Loader, 36 in Kenny. You know, he about to mess around and go for, for a 40 burger. <laughs> 40 burger, I wish I was there. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I think I think I think Jose has answered D'Angelo Russell's question. <laughs> yeah. Can he shoot? Yes, he can shoot. He gave a shout out to he said yes, he can shoot on Twitter. So it was pretty dope from that. But like I said, it was one of those nights, you know, it was just felt good. The the confidence, you know, going through it as a young player, the ups and downs of the NBA. And I, I think any player, um, unless you're uh delusional and you have a rational confidence, no self-awareness. Like I think, I think most 95% of guys, the confidence, it wanes, it does go up and down. But the feeling of that, what's the, what's the feeling of that like? You felt like the man, you know, you felt like, <laughs> ah, all right, let's get another 40 ball, but it ain't that easy, you know what I mean? So, you know, the confidence just gave me like, all right, you know, you obviously can shoot, you know, it was a good night. You know, every night's not gonna be like this. But like you say, it goes up and down. Cause now when you do have a, a you know a night that you go, you know, you know, shoot bad, three for ten, now you're looking at yourself like, oh, is this really, you know, what's going on here? And I definitely had those nights. I questioned myself after that game when I didn't go back to that, you know. Uh, but I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, that's not an every night thing, you know, it's special. You know, it's special for you, it's special for everybody. But you know, go back to just being you. Don't put so much pressure on every jump shot. And you know, I got a lot of hope from a lot of people from there, but it, but after that game, confidence was out the roof. But then it's one of those games. It's those games that when you shoot bad, let's keep the same confidence. So that was just the mindset I had, had all the time. And that's also just the luxury of this team with the amount of scores you guys have. You don't have to do it every night for you guys to win. Yeah, I don't, I don't got to score at all. You see, we really yeah. good at scoring. <laughs> you know, I just want a couple of steals, a couple of assists, and I'll be okay. And you know my little steal. That's all I want. <laughs> On the topic of shooting, is there, is there ever been any incidents uh, with teammates perhaps needling you to get better at shooting? Oh, yeah, for sure. So we were playing in L.A., uh, playing game against the Clippers. I think I missed maybe two. I think it was a heated game. You know, CJ's obviously still new to the team, but we're rolling right now. And CJ said to the sideline, I need a, I need a effing shooter. I said, he, and he's talking about me, and I'm and I, because I miss. And they subbed me out. So I'm mad at CJ, like, this guy just said he need a shooter, and they took me out. <laughs> Obviously, they put Trey Murphy in, but my thing is like, all right, I'm going to go up in the gym and shoot, and I'm going to show you I can shoot. So it was one of those moments that I don't know if he was being an a-hole or he's just being a good, a good leader or, or whatever, but he made me want to shoot better. So, But I definitely remember that, like, clear-eye view. Well, 
you guys may have a perception of C.J. McCollum. Um, <laughs> Tommy and I found out backstage that the Pelicans players have a ranking. <laughs> Biggest asshole to, to sort of just like the nice guys. And apparently, CJ is number one. <laughs> he's the biggest asshole. Proudly number one. On the team. And he he's, tells you he's, himself. He admits it. He yeah, admits it. Let's, I think we should bring him out. I think we should bring CJ McCollum out. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, CJ. What's up, man? I heard you guys are talking about me. <laughs> uh, yeah, that you're an asshole. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I'm 1A, though, so that means someone else is 1B. <laughs> uh, CJ, Mr. President of the NBP. At crazy day. Crazy 48 hours. Let's go back to last week, actually. Let's call it crazy six days in the NBA. And the Western Conference in particular... Uh, has been transformed with the addition of Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Lakers clearly getting better as well. Um, you tweeted out, uh, this is all because Ja Morant said he was good in the West. <laughs> I thought it was funny. I remember him saying that <laughs> he was good in the West and things were going really well for them and then they started losing some games and uh, I think an article came out and he said that Memphis gets blamed for everything, so I felt like it was the right time to <laughs> to blame him in Memphis for... That goes in the asshole review. <laughs> By the way, the tweet hit, though. It, it worked. It he never good. responded to my ad, but I know he's seen my mention. All right. Yeah. Uh, in all seriousness, though, uh, West clearly better um, over the last six days. Uh, which move do you think moves the needle the most? I would say the... The one that was hardest to miss, um, KD going to the Suns just because of his star power. Who's clapping in here? <laughs> <laughs> Get him out of here. Get him out of here, boo. Ooh. I respect that. I respect that. He's got the jersey and everything. The only reason you can stay is because I heard the money is going to charity for the tickets. <laughs> <laughs> so you can stay. Uh, otherwise, I would have security escort you out. Um, <laughs> That's not an asshole move. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think based on how good he is, obviously, as a player, what he brings to the table from a versatility standpoint, I think it's hard not to say that was the one that you noticed the most. Obviously, Book, you guys, CP, you, they're able to make that trade and keep Aiton. So they become better, for sure, I would say. Obviously, they lose Mikel, they lose Cam Johnson, some picks, and Jay Crowder, who wasn't playing, but I think that was the one you noticed. You obviously noticed the Dallas one because that's next door, right? You know, we play them uh, pretty often. It's like a 45-minute flight. Memphis gets better. They they grab some shooters, so I think everybody's kind of reloading and figuring out how to retool and, and compete at the highest level. Is it is it stressful at all that two of the Eastern Conference starters are now in the West? Like there's an element of like this. West, the West was competitive enough as is, and you just throw this guys, you throw these guys into the mix. I wish they stood in the East, but it is what it is, you know. <laughs> I mean, it definitely gets tougher, but you know, we just gotta compete. Get ready, get ready, get get ready to compete. You know, it's gonna be tough. I think I think what's interesting about the Western Conference in particular was there were Denver really had separated themselves going into the deadline. Memphis was firmly in second, Sacramento in third, and then four through 13 was separated by two or three games in the loss column. And nearly every team made moves to go for it. A month ago, it felt like with Brooklyn playing well, with KD in the lineup, it felt like the East was so top heavy. And now it's like flipped completely. And I think it's, um, I think it's remarkable how quickly things change in the NBA. It feels like literally four weeks ago, we were up here, or not up here, but we were on the podcast talking about the Brooklyn Nets being a tier one championship contender. And now both those guys are gone. CJ, you got traded last trade deadline, and you talked about it recently on the Draymond show, but just the experience of that as a player, 
so many guys today having gone through that. Yeah. I went through it twice. I documented the one from Pelicans pretty, pretty strongly. <laughs> um, but just that, that experience of getting traded, having to move your family, all that stuff. I was fortunate to be in a situation where I didn't find out on Twitter. I didn't find out like, you know, some players have watching the actual TV and seeing their name at the bottom or as some players have at the gas station while they're getting gas. Um, so it was more of a situation in which my family and I kind of orchestrated it behind the scenes, kind of speaking to the front office, speaking to management about changes that we felt were happening and that it was it was basically time. The writing was on the wall and we could kind of work this out. And I joke about it, you know, now I can joke about it, right? Um, I said, there's good divorces and bad divorces. This doesn't have to be a bad divorce. This can be like a amicable sp split where, you know, you get custody of the kids, you can still visit, you know what I mean? That type of situation. And it was like, I can always come back to Oregon. It won't be home, but like I can come back and visit, you know what I mean? And we were able to work something out to where um, it didn't catch me off guard. We got to talk about teams and it was, a, it was a happy divorce, so I'm fortunate. But I think with that, obviously, you have the family dynamic of having to leave. You know, my son was four weeks old. I actually went to his four-week appointment, and I flew out the same day. My family stayed behind, so that was tough. Obviously, my wife, she, she being back in Oregon, me being in New Orleans, you know, that was obviously difficult for us as first-time parents. And the work dynamic, right, if your significant other works, and my wife's a dentist, trying to figure out getting licensed in another state, there's a lot of issues that you face, figuring out the housing situation. People only see the, the amount of money you make, right? And they think, oh, you make good money, you're fine. It's like, yeah, we are fine. We do make great money. But there are some real issues that are associated with the human element, especially when you involve kids. And for me, our, my kid was four weeks old, but for some people, their kids are in school. There's that situation um, that makes it hard. And I always equate it to imagine, you know, you work at nine to five and one day you work in this city, the next day you work in another city and you have to figure out, you know, where you're going to live at and you're moving. Your sitting together may or may not move, but you're moving within 72 hours. For Devontae Graham today, he left today to go to San Antonio. He's playing tomorrow in Detroit. So it's like, shout out to my guy Tay. Like, that was my guy. And to see stuff like this happen, you clap you it up for my guy Tay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What are you saying? I was literally went to his house to go see him. And I'm like, where are you going? Like, you know, I know the trade happened, but he's like, yeah, bro, I got to pack for a nine day road trip. I got to uh, get out of here. And I was like, damn, that, that's like, that's just crazy. It sucks. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's in an instance. And I think, you know, with this being my 10th year and you haven't played in the league for as long as you have and you starting to see it, they don't mess around, man. Like, I, I, I kind of knew I was leaving, so I packed early. You know what I mean? I got a head start. I started clearing my locker out. I told our equipment guy three days before I got traded, I said, hey, start boxing my shoes up. I'll tell you where to ship. So, like, I knew. Some some guys don't know, and that's the element in which you come into the locker room. Tomorrow we're going to go in the locker room. Tay's name tag's going to be gone. He sits beside me at film every day. I sit in C4 to the right. He's C3 from the right, and it's just, like, it's awkward now, right? Like, it's just, just big change, and I think... The human element is a, is a tough part of it. And I think I feel most for the players that don't know. There's no warning. It just happens. That's got to be the toughest part of it. Yeah, Mikel Bridges um, t said earlier that, you know, he kind of he got the sense that he potentially could be traded just because of what happened last summer and, and when his name was dangled in the Kevin Durant talk. Um, but he was literally got traded last night. He was literally in Brooklyn today. Uh, and got interviewed during the game, and he said that uh, Damian Lee FaceTimed him, and that's how he found out he got traded. Um, and you think about it, look, no one's bemoaning the fact that we have the greatest job in the world. I mean, I'm not trying to make y'all jealous. We really do have the greatest job in the world. Playing in the NBA is fucking awesome. And there's that Don Draper meme from, meme from Mad Men that's like, that's what the money is for. And, like, that's fine. I agree with it. Like, you, I always go back to any other profession. Um, we're renting our apartment out uh, in Brooklyn. And the woman uh, who is renting our apartment has a great job. She, I assume she gets paid very well. Um, she came and looked at apartments in New York in September, signed her lease in late September to move into our apartment in January. 
Like that's the sort of lead time that a well-paid professional has in nearly any other profession. We don't have that luxury. Now we have other luxuries, don't get me wrong. But I, I, I think the, the chaos around these 24 to 48 hours, it's tough as a player and it's hanging over you too. Like Jose, were you positive you weren't going to get traded today? Not after that KD one, but <laughs> I was. I, I'm pretty. Uh, you know, uh, uh, New Orleans. I think I will. I don't think I'll ever leave. But you know, if it happened, yeah. it, you know, but that you know, it is a business. So I don't know how that works. But one thing I say about this trade thing, it's like when CJ came in. You know, we, Josh. You know, he was with Josh Hart and Kill Alexander. And you know, I think it's a big thing. I never. You know, obviously, this is my second year I've seen the trades. And I, I feel people, when they come in, you know, now you got to adjust to a whole new locker room. And that locker room was already adjusted to whoever was there. And, you know, it's just like, I feel like it's crazy. It's a, it's a crazy thing for me to see and to go through, you know. CJ is different. I think he's very comfortable who he is. So he came in being CJ. But, you know, for other people... Most still, assholes are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, he came in with his probably little coffee wine or whatever came in. He knew what he was doing already. So uh, tea with limited honey. Yeah, let me say that. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna ask about the basketball, just making the basketball transition because you know this was you last year, but there are a lot of these guys right now. You're thrown into a situation where you're on a competitive team and you got to figure it out in you know 36 hours. You don't have a month to get used to the sort of basketball fit if it's any different. What do you think the best way to do that is? Just to kind of just shut up and suck everything up? Or like, like what's the... I think, and Jose can speak to this. I think for me, it was just more so observing first, right? Like, I just kind of came in. I talked, I addressed the team when I got traded. Like, I know what this looks like in y'all's shoes, right? Because players have got traded to a team I was on. So for me, y'all going to see how I move, how I work, how I think. I want y'all to challenge me. I'm going to challenge y'all. And I want to get the best out of y'all. I want y'all to get the best out of me. And I want to be coached. And I think that was my delivery. That was my message. That's always been my message. And I think I was consistent with that. So it wasn't like, it's like CJ acts a certain type of way. He does certain types of things. But this is who he is. This is how he works. This is how he expects you to work. And this is what he's going to hold you to. This is his standard. And he wants you to, to reach this standard and get the best out of whatever you have to offer. And I think I approached it like that. It was like, look, I didn't say much in the beginning. I just hooped. I just came and did my job. I was like, look, I'm not going to know the plays. You're going to have to tell me the plays. I'm not going to know where I'm at at times. Like, it's going to be like that, but I need y'all to challenge me. And I think people respect that more than me just coming in trying to be people's bosses. It's like, no, nah, that's not my job. My job is to, is to play to help us win, to contribute, do what I can to make sure people around me are better. And when, when this game is over, they'll be like, CJ was himself. He was authentic from the day he got in to the day he left. Yeah. I could definitely agree. He was very clear on, like, I play, he told everybody I played every role. You know, I played the bench role. I played the six-man role. I played a starter role. Yeah, it's okay to coach me. You know, like, that's what he was very, very clear on. Like, yeah. CJ, I want to ask you specifically. I, I, I mentioned you are the president of our Players Association. Um, CBA talks ongoing. The date's sort of been pushed um, ahead of a June 30th opt-out date, I believe. Is that correct? Allegedly. Okay. Good. I want to ask you specifically about load management um, because this seems to be a particular point of contention uh, with people in my world now, in the media, uh, certainly with fans, rightfully so. Um, I'm sure players are talking about this and they see everything that's being said. They, they see uh, videos on Twitter of, of kids flying in to watch Jimmy Butler play and him not being available. Um, you have a tough task, of course, leading our union and, and dealing with owners. Is there a good solution? Is there a good way to solve this issue? Mm -mm. <laughs> I've, been, I've been dealing with this for, for weeks, months, years now, and I think the biggest, the biggest thing is this, right? We want our stars to play as much as possible, right? We want them to play nationally televised games. We'd love for them to play all local games. We'd love for them to play back-to-backs. Even the bad back-to-backs that we know shouldn't exist, like landing in Milwaukee at 3 o'clock and having to play, you know, a 7 o'clock game. You know, those travel back-to-backs. Like, all those things we think are important and we want our players to play in. But we also understand that there's two folds, right? There's two folds. There's, there's guys who really love basketball and it's hard to get them to not play. And there's guys who, you know, a, a normal 9-to-5, right, where they're just good at the job. And that's just the honest truth. And I think it's the balance of 
making sure that we're exerting ourselves properly, that we're also taking care of ourselves, but also the accountability factor of being realistic with the expectations and goals that we set on players and staff. Dame talked about it. They had a back-to-back against us. He really wanted to play. The staff held him out. They wouldn't let him play. That was a situation in which I'm sure he would love to play against me. I would love to play against him. The fans would love to watch it. But the team and the staff felt like him coming off an injury that wasn't the best for him and that they wanted to kind of protect him from himself. That's one scenario. The other scenario is, you know, a back-to-back in which a guy just doesn't want to play and he doesn't play. And we want to try to prevent those situations from happening. But we also have to understand twofold majority of the money that we get in our game is generated on playoffs and we need the best players to be available to play in the playoffs because although fans do care about a random Tuesday in Sacramento, they also care about April, May, and June when um, it's the summertime and there's not school for the kids and it's easier to travel. It's more accessible. There's more eyes. There's more viewership and there's more dollars that are generated from ad revenue. So I think when you look at all those factors, I don't have a solution. I'm trying to work on one. I'm trying to find one, but I think the happy medium is figuring out how to schedule games more properly. And Evan is going to watch this and I'm going to get a call from the NBA because (laughs) that's the way this job works. But um, I just want to go on the record saying that I think it's important from a scheduling standpoint. Obviously, we have a calendar to work with. We have arenas. We have all those things. But um, when they schedule certain types of games, like does it make sense for Giannis to play a travel back-to-back? Like when he's going to land at 2, get to his room at 2.35, his bag's not going to come till 3.15. That's your franchise. Like, we've gone through it. A lot of teams have gone through it. Every team is an injury away from a 10-game losing streak, right? Like, we just went through it, right? So I think it's the important factor of figuring out how to win, how to maximize our support from fans, how to give them what they want, while being able to put on a show for 82 games in a tough calendar year. I think you bring up... Sorry, what did you say? I have right. a Pelicans hat on. <laughs> they just talk about <laughs> Oh, we talking about how to worry about the players. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's like, wait a minute, I see a Pelicans I got hat. You, I got you. No, I, you bring up another great point, but this is what I'll say. Like, whether that was right or wrong, first of all, we won, so I'll take it. <laughs> Let's just start with that. We'll, we'll take it, said everybody. We needed that win. But secondly, they're in a situation where they're trying to protect their assets. So I have to be like, you know, I have to play both sides of the fence, right? On one hand, they only come here once or twice. They end up sitting players in both games. Our fans will get to see it. On the other hand, they're paying a guy $50 million a year to try to protect him from himself. And then he ends up getting hurt. And so they, they're, you know, their analytical staff, their medical staff would say like, maybe we should have sat him more. You know what I mean? So it's like the, 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 the catch 22 or whatever, whatever the case may be, the where you want to protect the players, but we also want our fans to be able to see players. And, you know, like I went to Milwaukee and I didn't play in Milwaukee. It was a back to back, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with some hand issues. I'm having some injuries that I'm dealing with personally. And I just, it didn't make sense for me to play in a game where I went to sleep at 5 a.m. because I got to my room at 3.15 a.m. It's like, it's the high risk for injury versus reward. Yeah, the, you bring up you bring up two points um, that I, w- I want to touch on. Number one, I totally agree with you on the scheduling stuff. If you are going to schedule nationally televised games specifically, where you're trying to get Jokic versus Giannis, don't schedule a fucking game the night before for both teams. That doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and and we've seen that a number of times. Like I think it's hard because there's so many games per week. Uh, the arenas are used for other things. It's difficult. I wouldn't want to be the computer or the group of people that schedule these games using whatever Kevin. algorithm they got. <laughs> it, it's it's tough. But if we are going to say we, we want marquee games, let's not have the teams play the night before. That's That seems like if we can limit that as much as possible, that's a possible solution. The other side you bring up is the medical staff side. And you you kind of broke it down, and I thought it was perfect. There's the guys that... You have to literally mandate. We have to sit you out. No, I'm playing tonight. No, mandated. You, we, you are sitting out. And then there's, I think, a group of guys, because you've done it a couple times, you've set a precedent now, and they don't necessarily love to play as much as maybe the other group. And so because you've set that precedent of we're going to sit you out here, coming back from injury, whatever, maybe it's a travel back-to-back, whatever, I don't, every team is different in how they do this. But it, it, it sort of gives them an out. It gives the player an out. So 
for all the guys, and there's a bunch of guys in media that are saying this, oh, it's the teams, it's the teams, it's the team. No, it's not always the teams that are sitting these guys out. Sometimes it is the players. Am I wrong on that? I am pro player, so. I am pro player too, CJ. <laughs> I know, but I mean, I'm really pro player right now. Like, <laughs> the proest of pro players. I cannot confirm or deny those allegations, but what I will say is that <laughs> we don't have funny? a solution. Your expression, as I started talking, your expression, you were like interested, you're interested, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, I know what he's gonna say. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> we all know what we're dealing with here, but I think the issue is how do we properly deal with this in a way in which we still can have an 82 game schedule. I'm, I'm upset with Evan because we have Mardi Gras during All-Star break. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm putting in complaints. You got 29 other teams putting in complaints about games, the timing of the games. We have a 9 p.m. game tomorrow. I work for ESPN. You work for ESPN. Why are we playing at 9 p.m.? Central time, which is 10 Eastern time. That is insane. We have kids. We have lives. I usually go to sleep at 9.30. Like, this is... <laughs> I'm going to be in the first quarter at like 9.15, which is aggressive. You know what I mean? So I say all this to say I haven't quite figured out what we have to do, but this is a conversation that I have to have with players and then we have to have with the governors is what is the happy medium understanding that the staff is going to hold us out for certain games? And if that is the case, how do we move through that? And then how do we also avoid situations in which players aren't being forced to play in games? Because that's not what we want. Because at the end of the day, the goal is to to compete for a championship. And you have to do whatever is best for your individual team, regardless of what that does or how that affects the public population. Because if the Warriors win a championship, no one's gonna care that Steph's out on that random Tuesday if you're a Warriors fan. You might be mad you didn't get to see him play, but that's the case for him. And then same for us and our team. Do you, do you feel fair. like- It's a fair point. Do you feel like another, another challenge is, you know, fans just may not know the extent of it, of guys who have injuries, but they're playing through injuries because obviously teams and players are not going to be fully transparent with every single, you know, thing where you have a, a sprain here or even a broken bone here in certain cases and you're playing through it. Uh, and so it's, and I, I understand why the teams don't want to do this for a bunch of different reasons, but there is a sense of like, is it frustrating at all when it's like, you know, you have an injury, you're playing through an injury and you sit out a night and people get mad about it. And you're like, well, you know, I have a, <laughs> there's a real reason why I'm sitting. I'll let Jose speak to this because he's played through some injuries I've told him to sit down with. Nah, you got it, bro. I, I mean, I'm going to play them. <laughs> I'm in a different situation than, you know, JJ and you. I'm going to play, you know. I try to get a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so, y'all can count on me playing every single night. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, I mean, I feel like, for me, player-wise, is uh. There's a lot of things that comes with that. You know, um, you want to play as much, me as me speaking personally, I want to play as much as game as I can. But also it comes about, I always, I always think a lot of stuff like if I don't play now, how that affects me later on or how that affects me, you know, with my ro my rhythm, my rotation and stuff like that. So it's a lot to go with it. But, um, you know, I think to be more clear with the injuries, you just got to, I mean, I really don't have an answer for that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, play through your injuries. Nah, nah, me. Don't play through your injuries. Be safe. I think I always tell guys because I've played through injuries. I've played through sprained angles that have turned into broken foot. So I know the other side. And I always say, you know your body better than anybody else. And as you get older and as you grow and as you go through those learning moments, I played in a lot of games I shouldn't have played in. Just to be honest with you, I played in games where I finished a quarter with a broken foot. I finished a game with a broken finger on my shooting hand. So it's like you got to be smart about it. And the competitive nature side is one thing. But jeopardizing your future and your career, as we've seen before, we talk about how this is a business, right? Guys get traded. They don't know about it. They give you a sweet tweet, cool, cool tweet about how they're so thankful for everything you've done for them and how you met so much of their franchise. And the next tweet is welcoming the guy they traded you for. So it's like you have to protect yourself, too. And I think that's the mindset of myself and uh, the executive committee and the PA is, look, you do what you got to do for your team. But you also respect the fact that you keeping the lights on for people in your household and your other family members and you have to protect your body and your potential earnings and how you earn. And I think that's important. And I'm playing through injuries right now. A lot of guys are, and that's our personal choice. That doesn't necessarily mean everybody should do that. And I don't recommend it. I think that if you're, if you're 
Injured versus hurt, right? You know what that means, JJ. We got some guys that'll play through injuries, and we got some guys that are really hurt. And it's a matter of which one are you and which type of player are you. And I think the teams know what they're getting into. As they go through a season, they realize some guys miss games, some guys don't. And it's a decision that they have to make because they're cutting the check. But I always I always err on the side of you know your body. And I tell the guys the same thing when they come back from injuries. You're a you're a tweak and something away from an extended period of time sitting down, so be careful and be cautious. Definitely, yeah. yeah. I think uh, that's a valid point. And you, you bring up playing when you shouldn't be playing. And, I, you know, I think if you really love it, like there's, there's games we've all been out there where maybe we shouldn't have been playing. I remember one year um, going into the playoffs as the last regular season game, and we were still fighting um, for that, I think, third or fourth seed. And I had like a I, they, Nike told me I couldn't wear the Kyrie's anymore, so I, I, I had to switch shoes. And I, I was like a guy that if you if I switched shoes, I was gonna hurt my foot. So I switched shoes, for, right before the last game, and I landed funny, and I like I had a severe you know heel bruise, and then um, then I had to guard you in the playoffs. Let's run let's run the tape. Let's run the tape. <laughs> And now they are going back to what they did game one, which is this aggressive trapping, and they waited till now. Good contest by Reddick. It didn't matter. And back come the Blazers. Caught him under pressure. Yeah, might because of shoes. Caught him. Got Reddick backing up. Kept alive by Amito. McCollum. Yes. That's good defense. Blazers have had the, the big edge off. I thought this one was good D, honestly. That's tough. Wow. <laughs> so. I had short hair in that. Very little, short hair. A little backstory on that. I always liked CJ, even though he had a big game and eliminated Duke when he was in college. I, I, I always liked him. His first, his first two years, he didn't play a lot. And going into that season, we played a home game in the preseason against the Blazers, and CJ went crazy. I mean, he, it was a preseason game. He had 34, 30, I don't know. He had a big number, and there was a moment in the second half. Again, I'm, I'm going into, like, my 10th year, um, and there was a moment in the second half where I tried to do my chase action with Blake. I'd throw it throw it to Blake, do a little wiggle, go get the ball, try to shoot. And CJ kind of cut it off, and he's like, he's like, yeah, not this year, man. Not fuck that. Not this year. <laughs> this ain't last year. This ain't last year. And there was, a, I'm gonna say this to you now. There was a five-year period where I hated CJ. <laughs> 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 and now, and now after tonight, that I've gotten confirmation that he is, in fact, an asshole. I feel, I feel vindicated. vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Only about 3% of the world knows that. So <laughs> to 97% of the world, I'm a great guy. I'm so humble and quiet and You calm are, and but an asshole with it, you know? Yeah. You're a great guy. But here's the thing. Let's, let's, you let's just, just be honest about this situation for a second. I was levels. a bench rider, certified bench rider. Show up to the games. No, I'm not going to play. Three o'clock's my game. Take a shower. Watch the game. So they gave me an opportunity to play. I'm playing against J.J. Reddick, you know, Duke legend, starter for the Los Angeles Clippers. This is my chance to show my coach, look, you can't take me back to the ghetto. Like, I can't go back to the bench. Like, <laughs> I need 30 <laughs> minutes a night, and I'm going to show you in the preseason. I'm going to show you on a random Tuesday in Milwaukee. I'm going to show you because... I'm not going back to the bench, and I'm a year away from being in Europe, so I got to figure this out quickly. So that was my approach to it, and, you know, I had to talk to myself because when you go through, like, I'm sure Jose went through with the doubt, like, am I going to play? Am I going to make it? Am I going to be in the league? What do I do if I, I can't do this? Like, what does that look like for me? You got to talk to yourself, and you got to talk to whoever you going against so you can mentally psych yourself out so that on that random preseason game that I don't feel like playing in, I feel like playing now because I remember the struggle. So I think that was my mentality and how I carried it over to the regular season because they told me, it was like, this is your last chance. Yeah. CJ, we were talking to Jose before you got out of here about the, the, the chip on his shoulder, you know, and just the motivation. You now, you've won most improved player. You've averaged 20 points a game, eight seasons in a row. At what point, we've talked, you know, when you were, the, when you were on the show before about your background and everything like that, but at what point, how do you not lose the chip? 
you know, when, you, when you've had a career like you've had, how do you keep up that motivation? Because you're not necessarily, you know, an underdog anymore. Yeah, I think it's what you play for. I think when you're younger, you play for money, right? Like, just to be honest, you want to you wanna carve out a role. You want to get to the league. You want to carve out a role in the league. You want to be a rotational player. Then you want to be a starter. Then you want to make money because you know all those things are associated with money. When you do those things, you find something else that drives you and that motivates you. And I think for me, it was just like, I knew I was going to make money. I didn't know how much, but I was like, I'm going to make some money playing this game. Cool. I'm going to be a take of my family. Then it was about maximizing my talent. So I think that's the goal. The goal isn't you make money, you give back, you help people, take advantage of your blessing. But the goal is to maximize what God gives you. And I think that was my approach. It was like God's giving you a gift. How do you maximize it so that when you retire, you can look back and say, I gave this sport all I had. Now I move on to the next thing. And I think that was my approach. And then, you know, obviously I'm married, I have a child, so the, the job is to provide and to provide the best way you can. And if you're not going to be home, you better be fucking good at basketball. So, <laughs> so I have to make sure that it's like uh, the sacrifices is, is for something, right? Like I'm not sacrificing, I'm not lifting at 10 p.m. to be average. I'm lifting at 10 p.m. so that when, it's, when the lights is bright at 9.30 tomorrow, like I, I know I did what I was supposed to do to be ready for this game. So I can live with hitting eight threes or I can live with going four for 20 because the preparation was what it was supposed to be. And I think that's how I stay motivated now. It's take advantage because you pray for this and you work for this now. Make sure you maximize your blessing. And when it's over, it's over. It's, that was literally, it was, that's a beautiful thing because that, that's literally what I told the eight and nine-year-olds the other day. <laughs> to them, I said, I hope you all play in the NBA, but what I really hope is that you all maximize your talent. And that's why I have no regrets for my career. That's why you shouldn't have any regrets thus far in your career. That's why you should have no regrets in your career. Because that's what it is about. Because people on Instagram or Twitter can say, that guy's a bum, but if he's maximizing his ability, no, he's not. No, he's not. The bums are the guys that don't maximize their ability. That's the truth. You may be more talented than me, but if you didn't maximize your, your ability, you failed. I really believe that. That's why I love what you just said. Last question for you real quick, and we'll get to the draft. Do you consider yourself a troll, a heel, an agitator? Yeah, a troll. <laughs> okay, good. I'll tell you. Good. What do you think, From CJ? one asshole to another? <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody familiar with the show knows that we occasionally do an old man of the three draft at the end of the show. How this works is we choose a topic, everybody uh, picks one at a time. So we're going to start actually with Jose. You go Jose, CJ, Tommy, me, get two back, Tommy, CJ, Jose, and so forth, till we all pick five. All right, so the topic today, Tommy. Greatest sports Agitators. Greatest sports agitators. All right. Uh, that's... We, again, we're picking. <laughs> not you, not the crowd. We'll let you chime in at the Good end. Choice, for any, Good any omissions. I would be that's surprised not Basically, that one is not picked. I, I have my, my draft board right here. I don't what want you draft? giving Jose and CJ any ideas, okay? At the JJ's end, extremely competitive. Yeah. All right. Um, my first one, I, I could. Metal World Peace, Ron Test. Okay. Yeah, great pick. That's a good way to start. Just think of people you hate. Ah, <laughs> uh, what's the? Uh, from any sport. Any from sport. Yeah, but he's up, so you're not up for a bit. I'm just trying to help him out. No, 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 no. What's the guy's name? The little guy from the Denver Nuggets. Denver he, Nuggets. He's, he's in Europe, and he. he Faco. <laughs> oh, what a pick. Uh, can't stand him. Great, great European player, though. That's a great first round pick. Can't stand him. Oh, Wish wow. him the best in Europe. I hope my brother gets to play against us. <laughs> the thing we were talking about is just, there, we could do this draft just with the NBA. I hope like, Eric we don't even have that. That's what I'm saying. I cannot yeah. believe you picked Faco. Yeah, that is, first round that pick. Faco. So I'm, gonna, I'm, taking, I'm taking Pat as my first one. I'm taking Pat off the board because he's going to get picked, and okay. I don't want you guys to have it. But he is definitely one of the current biggest agitators, I think, not just in basketball but in sports. Yeah. I'm think, I think I'm overthinking it now, like, you know what I mean? Okay. I'm definitely overthinking it. I like the pick, Tommy. Um, I will shit on your picks as they get worse throughout the draft, but I like that pick. Of course. Um, so I have two here. So uh, I'm going to go with Skip Bayless. For my first uh, pick. Ah, I didn't know we could do that. I didn't know. 
Anything. Was, all was, sports. It's, anything. It's, 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 it's an open subject. He averaged two great points a game. Sports he agitator. agitator. He averaged two points a game and gets to talk about basketball. It's crazy. <laughs> Skip Bayless. Uh, and then I love the guy, but when I think of an agitator, I think of Chris Paul. Um, and not just because Jose's sitting here. No, no, Chris, I agree. Chris agitates the fans, the officials, his own teammates, the other team. It's everybody. I agree. So, uh, is, so I'm up. I'm up. So I'm going a little old school. I'm going your former teammate, Lance Stevenson. Oh, okay. My second pick. That's pretty good. What about the second round? It's, it's fine. No, it's I, I mean, I think, he's, I think Lance is... You a, reach similar to how I reach for Fatco. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so my turn? So it's CJ's. CJ's, CJ's, CJ's. CJ's. Then you're going to have two. I get two. No, so you get one. I, I get two. He gets two. two. Yeah. Uh, it's, called, it's like a bookend snake. It's like know? fantasy draft. <laughs> yeah. Pat Bev's gone. Pat Bev's gone. Free agent right now. <laughs> <laughs> C- CJ's on my list. I'll tell you, CJ going to be on my list right I now. I didn't mean it like that. Y'all crazy. Y'all are sick. <laughs> Fellow podcaster. It's just a natural thing. Fellow totally. podcaster. You got anybody? <laughs> it's your pick, not mine. Uh, no, it's your, it's your pick. Yeah. Did you pick already? Yeah. What's your pick? You're, 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 you're up. Just, you have your you second round pick. pick. Oh, I'm up. Yeah, you're up. Uh, and mine is not in the game. I'm going to go... Rasheed Wallace. Shout out to my guy, Sheed. Big one. Sheed fan. But Sheed and the refs did not get yeah. along at all. You talk about an agitator to the refs. Yeah. He hates the refs till this day. Yeah. It's a good one. It's a good that one. That was a good one. You um, get two here, Jose. Dennis. Dennis Robin. Dennis Robin. It's a That's good, good one. one. Uh, who else? Uh, I'm going to go to a different sport. Floyd. Floyd Mayweather. Okay. It's, it's, it's a good choice. Pick. It's a good choice. It's back to me already? Back to yeah. you, yeah. Wow, it was quick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> help? Oh. That's a good one. Another fellow podcaster. Draymond, fellow podcaster. <laughs> Draymond Green is an agitator. He's uh, That's a, that is a good great. human being. Oh, just was Draymond. on his podcast. Great guy, you know. Dre, if you're watching this, I haven't forgotten about that investment you're supposed to send me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's just put that out there right now. But, you know, he's been kicking guys. He's done a lot of things. He's agitated some people. <laughs> Suspended and Sh- Shout out to my guy, Dre. <laughs> Tommy, you're up. All right, I'm going different sport, way old school. I'm going Ty Cobb. Wow. Ty Racist. Cobb? <laughs> You took your time with this. Racist. This is why we made the t-shirt. He really thought about this one. Babe Ruth's enemy. All right. I think he's like an all-time baseball. Like, there's not a ton of, we were talking about, we were talking at the back. There's not a ton of baseball agitators because it's harder with pitchers, especially. You know, they only pitch once every five days. I think Ty Cobb is probably the greatest baseball agitator in the history of the sport. I can't. I can't believe that's that. Like, that's an undeniable I, I legit pick. cannot I only watch Home Run Derby yeah. and the Indians How and the easily I'm going to win this draft. <laughs> All right. Oh so my next two, I'm going to go Reggie Miller and The Rock. Ooh, you stole my pick, man. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, the Reggie one makes sense. Explain The Rock. What the Rock mean? is the greatest agitator, yeah. but are you, are we counting in the history but are we of counting, professional but are we counting pro Outside of maybe Ric Flair. Oh. Man. Are we counting, pro, are we counting, pro, I mean, okay. I don't yeah. like well, you don't, you I don't, you don't know agree? we can do anybody. I, was just mad he didn't I wouldn't it. pick a wrestler. Because you know who I'm going to go. Do I get two here or no? No, it's You're back to Tommy. No, I'm a, you haven't yeah. figured out the snake yet. I know. Yeah. It's confusing. It's, I'm CJ, confused. You're definitely involved. You're definitely involved. I'm definitely sitting in, in the, far, the furthest seat league. to the right, and I'm not getting the snake action. Like, I don't understand. He just wants two in a row. snake in. action. You should be getting two. I should be getting two. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Up fourth. I'm going college. You guys remember um, Marshall Henderson? Ole Miss. Marshall Madness. I remember him. Eminem. Wow. Ole Miss. He used to hit the threes and go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my fourth pick. CJ, you up. I can't, I can't believe we're skipping like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go Stephen A. Smith. Um, That's a good one. Yeah. Yep. Shout out to my guy, Stephen A. That is a good one. First take, fellow ESPN guy. Knows how to get under players' skin, specifically lately. It's been Jay Will, a lot of Kyrie, Kyrie, him and Kyrie. I don't know what's going on there. But yeah, I'm going to go Stephen A. It's a good pick. Uh, how was it? You got two. Huh? Uh, 
Who? Grayson Allen is a good one, but now. <laughs> no. Doesn't deserve to be. He with the Duke. <laughs> yeah. He's on the list automatically. Damn, I need help. Um, nah. You can pick yourself for the record. Damn. Uh, you want us to come back to you or something? Uh, no, nah, I'm gonna go with. I like Ric Flair. Ric Flair is definitely one. Okay. Ric Flair. Oh, Ric Flair. All right. And then uh, I'm gonna. You know, this is just a shout out to my teammate, Najee. He gets on the people's skin. Yeah, that's a good one. Trey Murphy's a good, nice guy, so I can't pick Trey. I know you ain't here too, though, Trey. Trey's at the bottom of the asshole list. <laughs> Trey is gonna I... follow CJ steps with the asshole thing. I'll tell you that much, <laughs> yeah. But good guys, but you know, it's gonna follow that lead for sure. All right, close it out. Oh, it's me. Yeah. This is your fifth pick. Uh, he is not understood. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go prime time. Tell me. Uh, I'm going to oh, throw back. How do I explain a play to him? Deion Sanders, huge Deion Sanders fan. I, Deion's a great one. I uh, never thought I would be interested in going to a Colorado football game, but now I kind of am. I love his career, his path. I love the fact that he was unapologetically himself and walked out of interviews during pre-draft. Like, um, I'm not getting drafted here. Y'all yeah. got to look here. JJ really thinking on that list he got over there. You see what I'm saying? I think that's great. I just can't believe this one guy is going to follow me. It's I'm taking, say. I'm fifth. I actually am surprised he's here. I'm taking Tyson. Mike. Oh, yes. Or I could pick Tyson one Fury? Early. Mike Tyson. Oh. Mike Tyson. Mike. Fury. <laughs> that's a very word. My bad. My bad. You said the yeah. first name. He's the last name first. <laughs> I got it. All right. Let's see who he's so hyped about over here. But no, I just, I was, I was What's legitimately, I thought, I thought I was going to have to draft John McEnroe here, which is fine. It's a good, it's a good pick, but you guys just gave me KG, which is awesome. Oh, I can't believe I got KG yeah, in the fifth round. That's amazing. I'm going to just put a bow on that win. I'm going to put a bow on that win. Let's give a hand yeah, for a Jose one. Alvarado, CJ McCall. We can't thank you guys enough. Can't thank you enough for coming out. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks. Let's go.